and that, and that physician is the final gatekeeper in determining whether or not the patient's condition is, um, is such that the patient would be expected to die within six months from the disease if it runs its expected course. Okay? So the first, the, the first and most important eligibility criterion is a terminal illness that is expected to uh, take the life of the patient within six months if it runs its usual course. And that has to be certified on initial eligibility by an attending physician who is not employed by the hospice, the hospice if one exists, if one, if one has been designated by the patient, but most importantly, the gatekeeper, the person who says yay or nay, is an employed physician of the hospice. Okay? What's the second criterion? The second criterion in the federal regulations is election. So the patient or the patient's representative has to say they want to turn over the Part A benefits. So think about that. That's it. That's it. That's all the government demands. Government demands a progressive incurable illness deemed by medical professionals as likely to take the life of the patient, more likely than not is what the legal standard is, more likely than not to take the um, life of the patient within six months if it runs its usual course, and the patient has to say, I want the benefit. Does the, does the law say anywhere about the patient giving up all disease-modifying therapy? No. The, the, laws, the federal regulation says something about curative therapy. And what do you think the law means by the word curative? Or better yet, since you don't know what the law means, what do you mean by the word curative? Huh? Just goal. So by, by goal to cure, you would mean, would you mean that the evidence that exists would either suggest that the treatment has the potential to cure or not cure? Because if that were the case, every chemotherapy for any stage 4 neoplasm would be non-curative. Ah, boy, that's really interesting. Do you really think that? That's really, really interesting. The reason, the reason I'm... What's that? In just a provocative way. I think you're trying to provoke me. <laughs> I think that's really very, very interesting. So the reason, the reason to think about this is because the regulation used the word curative, and hospice agencies since 1982 have chosen to view the word curative as equal to disease-modifying. Even though the vast majority of disease-modifying therapies, primary therapies for life-threatening complications or therapies for the disease itself, the vast majority of them don't cure people. The, people remain, the patients remain sick. Patients with stage 4 cancer continue to have stage 4 cancer. Patients with cirrhosis continue to have cirrhosis. Patients with ALS continue to have ALS. Patients with Alzheimer's continue to have Alzheimer's. But there are disease-modifying therapies that might be used either to, in the intent of trying to re improve local control of the tumor so, or local control of the disease so the patient has fewer symptoms or prolonging life. But medical professionals know they're not curative because cure is not possible. Alzheimer's patients don't get cured. ALS is not a curable illness. So the word curative, if it's defined as curative, truly, excludes almost nothing. The benefit in the law excludes almost nothing because there are very few things that are curative. When Gleevec, the antineoplastic drug Gleevec, came out for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, it was, to me, a, a, an emblematic um, event in the history of hospice eligibility because here patients all around the country, patients were dying of gist. They were dying of it. And then they got this drug called Gleevec and the, disease, and the disease melted away. And from the early studies, it was very likely that they were either cured or had a long survival. 
So the availability of that drug meant that the patients were no longer eligible for hospice. Now, what if you have a drug or a treatment that's more likely than not, given the medical science, to prolong life for six months? Is that drug, is that another definition for the word curative? If you define curative within the framework of the benefit? So since you guys can't read my mind, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking. Because I spent a lot of time thinking about this as, as we try to create a system called open access hospice and then we watched it fail on the, because of the economic considerations. The reality of the world is that the Medicare hospice benefit was set up as a managed care benefit with per diem rates that were quite low relative to the services that had to be provided. Most hospices in the country lose money. Not anymore, most hospices, until, until most hospices became for-profit hospices about five years ago, most hospices were losing money. The not-for-profit hospices often lose money. The small ones all lose money. Hospices less than 50 patients, which is the most, most common not-for-profits, all lose money. So the Medicare benefit per diem rates were set up relatively low for the, for the degree of the services mandated by the regs. So as a result of that, since the law says that all of the treatments for the terminal illness have to be included in the full risk capitation, and hospices were therefore required to provide all of the drugs related to the terminal illness that were considered within their scope of practice, hospices during the 80s and the 90s deemed that any drug that was a primary disease modifying drug was curative and therefore excluded by the regulations. Even though, even back then, it didn't apply in any logical way. The drugs, the medicines for these diseases are not curative. Right? Memantine for Alzheimer's doesn't cure it. Rylatec for ALS doesn't cure it. Cisplatinum for lung cancer doesn't cure it. And yet the t all these treatments were considered curative and therefore could be excluded by the hospices. And the, fed the federal regulators went along with that even though on the face of it, it was illogical because it was an economic necessity. The important point to remember, um, so that's one reality. A second reality is that the regulations make it clear that whenever a patient has a life expectancy that is expected to be more than six months by the medical director, that patient is no longer eligible. All right? So, if there is a treatment for the primary disease that is more likely than not to extend life for six months, that patient must come off hospice. That's the Gleevec story. So, the word curative in the federal regs could be defined as any treatment that is more likely than not based on medical science to prolong life for six months or more. If a treatment has that as a, as a likelihood based on the evidence, not based on what patients say, because patients say stuff that has nothing to do with the evidence. So if that is true, then you could call that curative. Uh, that would be a label that would then make sense under the regs, even though the word curative still wouldn't make any sense. It should be called sufficiently life-prolonging or ineligibility-making, but it shouldn't be called curative. But at least that would make sense. The concept that all disease-modifying therapies are, are excluded under the benefit is simply not true. When you hear that from hospice providers, when you leave, when those of you who are going to be working with agencies get out there and you hear that we don't do curative therapies, in a very, very gentle way, and it will probably take you several years, try to get the leadership of your hospice to understand that what they're saying makes no sense, is not required by the federal regulation, and at least be honest about it. Because unless we're honest about it, you can never go to the government and say, this, this, we have to have outlier benefits for, for selected groups of patients. We have to have some mechanism for providing this treatment because it's the standard of care. It's provided within two weeks of death. And if you exclude curative therapies across the board, patients won't get the benefit until two weeks before death. So the only way the patient can get the benefit is if you pay for this other therapy upstream from that, which you will not do if you call it curative and hospice agencies say they don't cover it.